Well, what I've been looking into for, for the past 30 years plus has, has been the possibility of a, of a major forgotten episode in the human story. Uh, and and uh, that is a lost civilization that flourished during the Ice Age, uh, but that, that, that was almost completely destroyed in the series of cataclysms that brought the Ice Age to an end between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And in geological terms, and indeed human terms, that's very recently. Um, I'm not talking about a high-tech civilization. Certainly not, we should not be looking for us, for ourselves in the past. I'm not talking about cell phones. I'm not talking about rockets going to the moon. Uh, I'm talking about a, a civilization that mapped the earth, that explored the world, that was primarily based upon coastlines, which are now flooded beneath the 400 foot sea level rise that took place at the end of the ice age. Um, and and um, which had a, deep understanding of uh, astronomy and geometry. Uh, I would say at least equivalent to Western civilization's understanding in the mid to late 18th century. So I, I, I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, 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 about what we might regard as an advanced civilization in terms of, in terms of technology. I'm talking about an advanced civilization in terms of a level of knowledge that is not normally attributed to Ice Age populations. Uh, and I'm also suggesting that that, I'll use the word advanced, that that, that, that advanced civilization coexisted with the hunter-gatherer populations who we know for sure were also present uh, in the world at that time. And this is often assumed to be a rather uh, bizarre idea until we remember that our own civilization today, if we can even call it a civilization anymore. Our own civilization today coexists still with hunter-gatherer peoples, uh, particularly in the in the Amazon rainforest, where there are hunter-gatherer groups who who don't even know that we exist. Uh, but also in in places like the Namibian desert, where 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 the San uh, hunt, hunter-gatherers uh, p p pursue a very different way of life to our own. Yet these life ways coexist, and I'm suggesting that this was the case during the Ice Age as well. When you go through and you watch Ancient Apocalypse and go through each of these different sites, it becomes very difficult to imagine how the evidence that you're presenting is actually refuted. You know, this is, this is the interesting thing about your work is it's, it's so persuasive when you actually start looking at, looking at everything collectively and start to weave this, this global picture of what happened that it's consistently surprising to me to see people, you know, attacking it. And it's not surprising from a psychological perspective, I understand it, but the preponderance of evidence that you're providing is, is really enormous as you go through all of these different sacred sites. And then there's that, you know, the black layer of death that you find in the, in the rocks. And there's just so many different things. But if you had to, if you had to steal man their argument, the mainstream narrative argument, if you had to steel man it and say like, all right, this is the best, this is the best refutation of this collective thesis that I have. What would, what would you say is their steel manned well, argument? I haven't seen a really effective refutation. And by the way, I'd like to add that, that, uh, the ancient apocalypse docu-series, uh, builds upon more than 30 years of work in, in my books. Uh, inevitably, when you're making a docu-series where episodes are half an hour long, uh, it, even in eight episodes, it's not possible to, to represent the entire body of evidence uh, upon which I rely. Um, but it's interesting that, that the reactions to it by the mainstream have not, by and large, got to grips with, with what I'm proposing, but have simply been a, a, a deluge of uh, insults and, and ad hominem attacks, uh, particularly accusing me of, um, of promoting racism and, and white supremacy. Uh, although uh, race is not mentioned uh, ever in Ancient Apocalypse, uh, that is the most common uh, attack that is, that is, that is made on, on, on my work. And I, I find that personally hurtful since I'm, I'm married to a woman of, co a, a woman of color and, and since I have seven mixed race grandchildren. 
uh, you know, who who will be exposed to these these kind of lies that are that are being spread about me in order to cancel me, in order to get people to just turn off and not even and not even give my work a, a chance. And I I think that shows a, a kind of desperation uh, and 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 also lack of moral rigor on the part uh, of of those who wish to see uh, my work shut down. This seems to be symptomatic of something that's in society right now, where actual discourse between opposing sides has been completely forgotten. This this old idea of the Marquis de Queensberry of debate, right? Like where we had some, some, there's none of that anymore. It's just whatever the lowest blow, whatever the, whatever the most hurtful thing that one side can say without even addressing the issue, it seems like we've been in this race to the bottom not and it's it's yeah. actually you know archaeology is typically a, a cool corner of the of the science debate and of of pop you know popular culture but even in this it seems like you challenge empire or the narrative you challenge the mainstream anywhere and they take it as a threat everywhere it, it seems is what we're what yeah. we're experiencing yeah. That's that's right. And although uh, although in some ways you're right to say that archaeology is a cool, a cool corner of this, that there's not been too much heated debate. Um, it's important to remember that archaeology uh, claims to hold the keys to the human past, uh, and it claims to hold sole ownership of the human past. Uh, I think this is part of the reason why the reaction to my work has been has been so intense um, because I'm not an archaeologist uh, and I've never claimed to be an archaeologist. I'm a, I'm a journalist with an interest uh, in investigating subjects that, that some people prefer to avoid and, and in my case that subject has been the prehistory of, of humanity and somehow it seems outrageous to the key holders that an outsider should come in and say they may have missed something incredibly important. They often they often claim that I'm, they often claim that I'm claiming that there's some sort of conspiracy theory in our, some sort of conspiracy in archaeology. And and in addition to be being told that I'm promoting racism and white supremacy, I'm also being told that I'm promoting conspiracy theories. But I don't claim any conspiracy in archaeology. I think archaeology is simply working the way that most disciplines work, that they get locked into a particular point of view. The right word for that is a paradigm, uh, that that paradigm governs how they react to new data, that the tendency, once you're locked into a particular worldview and a particular paradigm, is to defend that uh, to the death uh, in in every way that you can. Your career depends upon it. Uh, your the the. the Applause of your colleagues uh, depend depends upon it. Uh, research funding depends upon it. There are so many examples. I give many of them in in my 29 book 2019 book uh, America Before. There are so many examples of archaeologists who have stepped outside uh, the the narrow bounds of accepted theory in archaeology, such as Jacques Saint Mars uh, in in the Bluefish Caves in the Yukon, uh, who back in the 80s was proposing that human beings had been in the Americas at least 24,000 years ago. Mm. And this went against the, the then prevailing narrative that was called Clovis First, which held that there had been no humans in the Americas until around 13,400 years ago. Well, instead of, of actually investigating Jack Sankmar's findings, the academy turned upon him viciously. Uh, all his research funding was stripped away. Uh, he was... Uh, humiliated at conferences. Former friends would pass him by in corridors and completely ignore him. Uh, He was was snubbed in every possible way and huge efforts were made to discredit his work. But you know what? He was right. Back in uh, 2021, the evidence came out that he'd been absolutely right at Bluefish Caves, that the human beings had been there 24,000 years ago. And now, of course, we know that the whole Clovis first narrative is bust. Uh, and complete nonsense that human beings have been in America even longer than 24,000 years ago. Uh, I, I cite evidence in in that 2019 book, America Before, 
uh, of humans being in the Americas 130,000 years ago, 10 times as long as uh, the Clovis, so-called Clovis culture. Uh, and that evidence doesn't come actually from outside archaeology. It comes from, from a leading uh, group of archaeologists at the University of San Diego. Uh, and it's on display in the San Diego Natural History Museum. Uh, they found evidence of human tool use, uh, slaughtering and, and um, butchering a, a, a mastodon um, uh, 130,000 years ago, just, just south of San Diego. And again, rather than consider the implications of this, the response of the rest of archaeology has been to dismiss it, sneer in it, deny that it's possible on the grounds that, okay, we were wrong about Clovis, but we don't accept that human beings have been in the Americas for more than 30,000 years. So yeah. somebody saying humans have been in the Americas for 130,000 years has just got to be wrong. And this is just, it's just so unfortunate that, that, that there's this aspect of, of science, which instead of responding with curiosity to new evidence and new claims, just tries to shut those down. And this is greatly to the disadvantage of science in the long run. But, and I'll, I'll, co I'll complete this long rant in a moment, mm -hmm. but in the long run, it is the case with all paradigms that eventually the evidence that cannot be explained by the paradigm builds up to such a level that it becomes ridiculous to keep faith in the old paradigm. And that's when paradigms shift and we have a, a, a revolution in science uh, taking place. And that has happened a number of times in the past. And I believe it's going to happen uh, over our understanding of the prehistory of humanity as well. Yeah, it kind of uh, evokes the image of, uh, of tectonic plates that are kind of stuck and they want to move, they want to move, but they're, they're kind of frozen. And, uh, yes. and the paradigm's frozen and then they finally move and there's a big earthquake and it frees it up and everything shakes and a lot of things topple and then, you know, everything settles on the, on the backside and of that. And then a new paradigm forms. Yeah, uh, and, exactly. and that becomes the conventional wisdom, the accepted knowledge for a, for a period of time. And then very often that eventually that new paradigm will also be, will also be overthrown by. I just have a feeling though, that if, if someone comes to overthrow your paradigm with new evidence and you're a great grandfather out, out there somewhere, you won't look at them the same way that the narrative currently is looking at you. You know, I think there's a, there's a, a flexibility of mind that needs to, that we really need to evolve as a species because what you're talking about has been seen in every different field of science. I mean, take the example of Ignis Semmelweis, right, who worked yes. in OBGYN and, and noticed that hand washing had a significant impact on the survivability of mothers and children in this process. And then he was literally thrown in an insane asylum and beaten to death dying of sepsis probably from the wounds that weren't clean from dirty hands right like the irony of this and then given a nobel prize you know posthumously That's for his work true, yeah. but this is there's so many examples of that where yes. someone comes up with a theory and they're just completely you know completely uh ousted and attacked and and this is yeah. This is uh this, this is, is symptomatic is, of um, something that needs to shift. I hope if I hope if somebody presented compelling evidence that that I'm wrong, that there may have been a, a, another kind of civilization present in the world during the Ice Age as well as hunter gatherers. I hope that if somebody came up with really compelling evidence on that, uh, then I would be open to consider it. I, I'm, I'm human. I'm filled with error also. Uh, I also get stuck in my own rut. There's no there's no doubt about that. But I would I would want to be I would want to be open to that. The problem is that no such compelling evidence has been presented. It just it's right. just really straightforward dismissals, appeals to authority, uh, saying Hancock doesn't know what he's talking about. Hancock isn't an archaeologist. How, how dare he even suggest this? Uh, a journalist in the Guardian newspaper in England um, asked actually why Netflix had allowed the series, uh, as, as though you know people are not capable of making up their own minds. This is part of the problem with this with this um, outlook of, of the so-called experts in our society is that they despise the, the, the man and the woman in the street uh, and, and, and don't believe that they're capable of reaching rational decisions about things without being told what to think. And I, I find myself more and more embroiled uh, in, in this. It's a, it's a much bigger debate than just the debate about the possibility of a lost civilization. Um, it's a debate about free thinking and free speech in our society today. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you a wild story and if people if people accuse you of wild stories then they're going to accuse me of even wilder stories. So maybe I can take a few arrows here for you and take take a little pressure off uh, off of people slinging rocks at you. So I've become quite close friends with uh with a gentleman named Matthias De Stefano and mm -hmm. he remembers many of his past lives. The most notable of which was he was a mother in a civilization he calls Kem which was in the Nile Basin and he and it was for Egypt so yeah kind of... yep mm -hmm. and he was he was there roughly you know at the end of at the end of the final um the final spasms of the ice age 9600 BC he was there right as they right as you know civilization started to repopulate after yeah. after the floods and after the cataclysms and so he wasn't there in Atlantis, but his descendants were Atlantean. So, and Atlantis to him was, there was one central Atlantis, but there was many actual outposts in different cities, all in, all in, you know, water regions, right? They were, they were a, a seafaring culture and they were in a variety of different places. And then as you know the theory really everything that he remembers all the stories that he was told and they would they would make write maps of the stars and do so many things that actually corresponded with everything you were saying but as as you were saying the the meteors came and they started striking the earth in many different places and the water started to rise yeah the there was some immediate destruction but most of the atlantean actually culture was able to was able to spread and disperse so it wasn't like i think we see images on movies and tv where atlantis was just destroyed in a in a minute actually yeah. a lot of them thousands tens of thousands were able to get onto boats and travel to different sites around the world and higher higher ground sites and he describes the civilizations as megalithic you know but not advanced they were still riding around in donkeys but they had these mm -hmm. giant megaliths and the technology yeah. the technology that they had was a spiritual technology and mm -hmm. they had four different guilds that were correlated to the elements so they had the water guild and this is his this is you know what what passed down from the atlantean culture and they had the yeah. water guild the earth guild the air guild and the fire guild and they practice mm -hmm. in these deep spiritual training with psychedelic compounds and with all of the different advantages that they had and what he was he was a part of uh the water guild and what the water guild would do was the water guild was involved in actually cutting the stones so they would mm -hmm. they would drip water in a line across the stones and then they they would form resin they would get in resonance with the water and actually use mm -hmm. the water to actually cut the stones so some of the smooth okay. cuts of these stones that don't look like they had chisel work the explanation for him is, yeah they were using they were using water now of course this is wild and and our field of belief wouldn't even it's open only wild it's only wild because we've been schooled to think that such ideas exactly are wild. exactly there's, there's actually nothing particularly wild about it because we, we really are quite ignorant on the mystery of consciousness and, and 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 what it is what it is to be a human being i mean many mainstream scientists will say gosh somebody's speaking about reincarnation what rubbish there's no such thing as um as as, as reincarnation but how do they how can they possibly know that you well, know also how the they, university of the university of virginia has over two thousand case studies that they, Ian that Stevenson, they publish. i think was the, yeah. was the leading figure in investigating that he he went to cult you see our culture western culture um, is uh, profoundly materialistic, uh, and it and it utterly rejects any idea of reincarnation, um, because that implies that there's some non-material aspect of consciousness which can survive death and can be reborn uh, in a body, and that just flies completely in the face of the whole materialistic bias of Western culture. And as a result, uh, children brought up in Western culture are subjected to this ideology of materialism from a very early age. But what, uh, what Ian Stevenson found is that up to the age of about seven, uh, and he documented this in an extremely scientific way, up to the children who remember past lives is the title of the book, up to the age of about seven, uh, many children in many different cultures have memories of past lives. But in Western culture, uh, those memories are discouraged by their parents mm -hmm. and by their education system. So, so Stevenson went to India 
where there is not this discouragement of, of belief in past lives. And he began interviewing young children there and he found astonishing evidence. Again, it's fully published and fully documented in his book, Children Who Remember Past Lives. Uh, he found absolutely compelling evidence that reincarnation did take place. Kids who would remember being born in a village 300 miles away, who would know of a certain object hidden under the eaves of a house in that place where they had once lived, he was able to go and test that. And again, the establishment, the, 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 the academy has just reacted to this with, with derision because it doesn't fit their paradigm. Mm -hmm. But what do they know and what do we know really about, about the human creature? We're just beginning to scratch the surface. Consci consciousness is such a huge mystery of science. And fundamentally, when we talk about reincarnation, we're talking about consciousness surviving physical death uh, and, and passing on. Uh, and and t to me, that makes a, a great deal of sense. And I don't think it should be sneered at. I think it's something that's worthy of, of further investigation. So I'm very interested to hear uh, the, the, the story that you're telling about Matthias Di Stefano, but particularly since, since what he's remembering uh, accords very much with, uh, with, with good geological evidence of what happened yeah. at the end of the ice. Absolutely. And, and, and Particularly so, since since um, I also think that Atlantis wasn't one place; um, it was distributed uh, around the best real estate on Earth, the coastal lands, That's during it. the Ice Age, um, and and it may have it may have uh, taken a, a principled position not to interfere with the lives of other cultures that it coexisted with, or to have minimal contact with them, but. When the cataclysm came, when those those coastlines were flooded, when when the, the that, that civilization began to go down, there certainly were survivors, large numbers of survivors, and the places that they took refuge were amongst hunter gatherer populations. And I, I've made this point a number of times before, but if our civilization today were to collapse, and I think that's a real possibility, uh, if it were to fall apart completely, because it's such a fragile civilization, really. I mean, nobody, very few people in our civilization have the, have the faintest clue about how to survive. I'm one of them, actually. Hmm. Um, and and um, the only place, that the only people on planet Earth who really have got the business of survival in adverse circumstances totally nailed down are the hunter-gatherers. They're the ones who actually know how to survive. And it would be quite natural for survivors of our so-called advanced civilization to take refuge amongst hunter-gatherer populations and learn from them and at the same time perhaps teach them some of what we know. Uh, and that's really all that's being said about, about Atlantis in, in my argument. So I'm fascinated to hear that uh, Matthias de Savano has had past life experiences in this, in this realm.